So our next speaker is uh, Michael Rose, um, who I think shares with Ray the conviction that there is no actual limit to human life expectancy except insofar as the technology is limited at this point in time. The significant thing about Michael is that while a lot of this is in the realm of theory, Michael in his work has actually and practically extended lifespans by a multiple of two and almost three. Uh, the only problem so far is that it's fruit flies. <laughs> Michael? A little irony of our uh, technological revolution. Um, let's see. Okay. Well, nothing could be more intimidating for a scientist than following Ray Kurzweil. Um, uh, I, I can't tell you uh, how I feel watching him up here uh, lay out the future for you. Um, I am uh, Dr. Short Term. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about 2020 and beyond, which I know a number of our speakers will be. I'm really about uh, the project Ray just described, which is getting you through the next 15 years in good health. Um, uh, I, I, do I have a pointer here? Let's see, is that a pointer? Ah, excellent. Uh, even though this says University of California, Irvine, I am a Canadian. Um, just outing myself about that. Um, in 1971, in fact, I was living in Yorkville Village as a young Canadian punk attending Victoria University, actually, so I had no idea about this venue, so this is bizarre for me. Now, of course, I'm an aging Canadian punk living in California, or one of uh, Moses' uh, Zoomers. Um, whoops. Today, I'm going to do something I've never done before, which is I'm going to talk in public about my role as chief scientist for this uh, privately held corporation, Genesient, a 21st century genomics health company, which is all about taking what I do with fruit flies and giving it to you. So this is already part of what people are talking about. In a sense, what is going to happen in health is what is happening to computation. Exactly as Ray has been saying very prophetically for years, Biology is becoming information technology, and today I'm going to give you an example of that. I hope one uh, not as painful as our research is. The way I have of explaining Medicine 1.0, as I call it, the last uh, uh, 300 years of medicine, is it's medicine in the dark. You identify a very specific medical problem, and if you're lucky as a physician or a biologist, you identify a very specific solution to that problem, you solve it, you move on to the next problem. The problem with Medicine 1.0 and its approach to uh, nutritional supplements, health supplements, whatever you'd like to call them, is that this works fine when you have a very simple pathway. Here I show a very simple pathway for making serotonin, which is vital to our mental emotional health. And you may notice here Vite C, that's vitamin C, and there are a bunch of vitamins and, and indeed nutrients that play a crucial role in this uh, simple two, three-step pathway. But now, what we have discovered in the last 20 or 30 years is that is nothing like how most of our physiology works. Uh, this is a classic illustration that you would have been taught uh, in, in a biology class 20 years ago. This is more like 10 years ago. What we now know is this is what our physiology looks like. This is a diagram of the genomics of just path one set of pathways in one organism. In a sense, what genomics has done is it's turned on the lights in the physical plant, the industrial plant of your physiology, each and every one of us. So now we are, as biologists, given a view of physiology whoop, that looks like this. We can see everything. Before, this factory floor would have been in the dark for us. And a biologist would spend their entire career maybe with a flashlight looking at that particular device there, having no idea of the vastness of the physiology that surrounded that biologist. And yet we still made a little bit of progress one step at a time. Now all the lights are on genomically, and we can monitor what all of the genes in your body are doing. It's an amazing moment in the history of biology. 
Now, let me just step you through uh, a little uh, telescope history. It was only in the 1960s that we discovered the basic alphabet of genomics, which, of course, is more popularly known as genetic code. Genetic code has told us what the DNA here is coding for in terms of the amino acids of the proteins in your body, and these are the amino acids on the periphery, and this is a coding diagram. It was around the year 2000 that we basically got all kinds of whole genomes from animals, first nematodes, then fruit flies, then people. It's really, a, in terms of people, a transition from the year 2000, 2003, but certainly by 2003, in at least some sense, we'd finished the human genome. So what that was like was like opening up a book in a language you've never read before, and you see all the words. And you know the alphabet, so you know like there's A, B, and C in a, in a Roman alphabet. And there we were. But that really doesn't solve our health problems. It's a solution to the health problem, which is really what I'm talking about today. It's the use of this uh, complete vocabulary of the human genome that I'm interested in. <laughs> so what I'm going to introduce today for the first time for any audience, this work has essentially been secret for the last two years, is what we consider a first-generation solution to this problem of rewriting the functioning of your genomic language. And here's how we've done it. The key trick was figuring out how to make evolution in a laboratory answer that question of how we can change the genomic language. And I'm going to show you the abstract version of this, then I'm going to show you a horrifying concrete example. Um, the basic idea is, and I've been doing this now for more than 30 years, is selecting for later reproduction, generation after generation, forces health-impairing genomic words out. By genomic words, of course, I mean genetic variants. So you can think of a genomic bad word as something really nasty that can happen to you. And the way evolution normally works, and I'm going to show you an example of this in a second, is if you're going to be killed off by a bad word, a deadly gene, before the start of reproduction, natural selection is very good at cleaning that stuff up, cleaning up your language, sanitizing it. But at later ages, it doesn't do that. At later ages, evolution by natural selection is perfectly happy to let you die. So in the lab, I realized this in 1977, and it's the foundation of my career. I realized that if we were to shift reproduction to a later age, move this box of reproduction activity to a later age, so this is age going from left to right, in case I haven't made that clear enough. We shift the time of reproduction to later in your life, that evolution would automatically clean up our genomic language. So here's what happens, boom. And if you can make a population do that, you can create a longer, more robust lifespan. Now, this may seem very abstract to you, but in fact, everyone in this room is the beneficiary of this having gone on in our species for millions of years. And of course, the next step, and what this whole effort has all been about, is to move the nutrigenomics that we're talking about. We're talking about substances that will not need FDA clearance, at least in the first instance. We will add to those substances pharmaceuticals, which will take longer. Pharmaceuticals that will indeed cure diseases that are related to the deterioration of your health. And the reason why we have this program, something this ambitious, just over the next 10 to 20 years in mind, is because we are now working with the actual key phrases. We have a working knowledge of the genomic language of health. Thank you very much. Hey, Moses. Hey, you're early. <laughs> Gosh, I don't know where to begin to uh, ask you questions, except I, I well, if, if people here are having some of the same reactions I am, I'm interested in this practical stuff, right? How do we get to the point where all of these miracles will finally arrive? So I ask Ray the question, uh, do you maintain any particular and special practice yourself? Uh, no, I do not, actually. I, I don't do anything that your, your doctor wouldn't tell you to do uh, because I'm waiting for our human clinical work to check the fly work that I just described, the fly to human genomics, back to the fly, 
So we're hoping to do the human clinical testing over the next six to eight months. So ideally, by the next year, your 10th anniversary, we will actually have products. And this will be something that we will consume? I mean, you said the word Nutra. Yes, so our, our first generation of products will be things that you can consume uh, as a normal part of your diet at a reasonable expense, um, rather than going to a, a big laboratory and being injected with all kinds of weird stuff. But stuff to swallow? Stuff to swallow, ideally. Huh. Yeah, we wouldn't want you hooked up to an IV. Uh, I don't know if Ray's still here, but I read that Ray uh, takes somewhere between 150 and 210 supplements a day. And, and that is so onerous that he's actually hired a pill wrangler to open all the tubs and get all that stuff up. But just swallowing it, I would think, would take enough time. My, my favorite approach is, is liquid supplements small bottles which would contain a number of, of ingredients and not, I hate taking pills to be honest with you. Yeah, and, and then I wanted to also ask you this business about the delayed reproduction. Did you just like separate the boy flies from the girl ah, flies? Ah, uh, no, no, no. I'm often asked this question. Uh, they get to have all the sex they want. So journalists often call this the career woman experiment, you know. You, you meet some nice guy, it's their term, you meet some nice guy and you settle down and of course, right, you're the female, he's the guy. If you have children, he's not gonna take care of them, at least in the 20th century. And uh, so you have your choice, you know, are you gonna be a lawyer, MD, or are you gonna have kids in your 20s? And more and more women, of course, want the career, they don't wanna have the kids in their 20s, so they delay their reproduction, they still have sex. And that's exactly what I did with fruit flies uh, for hundreds of generations. So. A woman who has children later in life will live longer? No, it's an evolutionary change, Moses. Thank oh. you for asking that question. Doesn't happen. Please, I'm not advocating celibacy. <laughs> no. Evolutionary meaning you that get has to reproduce, to happen. you actually have the kid. Right. Not not the rehearsal. Right. But we enjoy you the have the child in your thirties and possibly in your forties exactly. as opposed to your so, teens or your twenties. Uh your daughter asked me this question earlier during my interview with, with her. And uh I said it was the analog. Sister. Oh, I'm sorry, your sister. Um, um, obviously, your parents were very active for a very long time. Um, so we do the equivalent of, of people reproducing in their 80s and 90s of years of age. In, with, in my laboratory, with fruit flies. With the flies. We don't advocate this for you. Relax. No, but I'm yeah. trying to understand yeah. that if we then transfer this practice to humans, and the humans then reproduce at a later age, and this goes on for, for how many? thousands of years, you'd get your result. Anybody want to wait thousands of years? Well, Anyone? but, but yeah. you're promising these phenomenal advances in the next 20 to 40 years. Um, I'm hoping that we can start next year and cumulatively enhance people's health over the next 20 years so that everyone in this room can participate in this revolution that is coming in 2020 or 2030.